Grace, mercy, and peace is yours from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today is the uh, lesson from uh, John's first letter, and uh, while it is a short reading, I'm not going to read all of it to you, just a small part. The last verse says this, And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. My dear friends, today is All Saints Day. It is a day to remember, it is a day to rejoice, it is a day to reflect. We remember on All Saints Day those who have gone before us through the gates of heaven. Particularly, and in, in some churches still, they will read the names of those who have passed away in the previous year. Sometimes they will ring the bell each time. There are all kinds of traditions around All Saints Day. And of course, All Hallows Eve, even, which is Halloween, is the night before All Saints Day. You see all kinds of different celebrations that go on around the world about All Saints Day. And it is a Christian holiday which allows us to focus not on the fact that we have people who have died, but on the fact that we have people who have followed Jesus into heaven. And that's why it is more than just a day to remember, and that remembrance is a happy remembrance. It is a day to rejoice. It is a day to rejoice that we know that people have followed Jesus into heaven, that we know that he has lavished us with love that makes us God's children. And that in that place, as God's children, we have been welcomed into the kingdom. And finally, then it is a day to reflect, a day to reflect on who we are, a day to reflect on the fact that this is just part of our eternal life, and the fact that God is with us through all those different parts of life. And so we look at that today, and it's interesting because the three texts that we have, and when you get a chance, you can go home and read all three of them, the three texts are three that will show up frequently at funerals and or memorial services. You will hear these texts read. Uh, one is from the Revelation to St. John, where it talks about that end time, and it talks about people being welcomed into heaven, and especially gives us that verse that says there will be no more tears in people's eyes, and that all the pain and suffering will have been wiped away. That is a wonderful and positive text. And then you've got Jesus with the Beatitudes talking about blessed are those, and he talks in terms that clearly are about the now and the not yet, now in, on earth and the later in heaven. And so all of these texts are helpful for us as we talk to people about the loss of a loved one. And so they are naturally found on All Saints Day. But I want to focus on three things that we can learn and look at in this letter from St. John. Three things that come up just in those few short verses. I know sometimes we have a reading that goes on very long. Sometimes we have something that's very short. And, and it may be difficult to think, well, why did we do something that short? It seemed like it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't much there. There are at least three things that we can focus on in this passage that I want us to, to touch on today. The first one is simply this. We are God's children. And that's tough for us. As I said to the uh, children in the children's message, it is tough. We, we don't want to be called a baby. We don't want to be called a child. We don't want anybody making us feel like we're somehow less than we think we are. And so our brokenness, our sinful nature sort of... Sort of Grinds against this concept of being called a child. And yet, when we hear it in this context, when we understand that it's God's love that has done this for us, and that it is something that makes us special in, in the kingdom, it feels a whole lot better. But it's important to note that this is something not that we do, but it is something that God has done for us. It is not something that we can work toward or strive toward. And that's why this analogy, this picture of being God's children is, is perfect. Because you can't work to become somebody's child. You either are or you aren't. And in this case, God is saying that he has loved us so much that he's made us children, even after we rebelled and tried to get away from God and harm God, God raised us up to this additional level, made us children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so not by anything we did, but God does this. And, and so it's an amazing thing to see that there's nothing we can do, but God's love does these things for us. And we should, again, be able to remember and rejoice and reflect in that truth. But then there's a second piece I'd like to look at, and that's in that second verse that was read. It says, Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we see him as he is. In other words, we're not quite yet sure what we're going to be, how we're going to be. 
uh, what our bodies will be like, what we'll function like, all those different things. I remember growing up, they used to talk about the fact that, you know, angels have wings because you see in the, in the Bible descriptions of angels and sometimes they have wings when they're in the court of the Lord, especially in, in, the, in the prophetic books of the Old Testament. And so the, the picture was always when you get to heaven, you earn your wings and we all get to fly. That seemed exciting to people. And, until you talk to people who don't like flying and then it's kind of like, you know, you kind of scary, you know? Uh, people who are afraid of heights, you know, didn't like that one. And, and somehow our, our discussion of that seems to have changed lately. We don't talk about that anymore. These are all images. Images to help us deal with the fact that John says, what we will be has not yet been revealed. I, the image that I, that I take the most comfort from is seeing Jesus who can somehow appear among the disciples when he wasn't there before. Somehow he isn't bound by all the laws of physics and all the laws of this world and has the ability to do things that we can't even begin to imagine. And I think if, that, if that's what it means, that's going to be kind of exciting. But I'll bet there's a whole lot more than it's exciting than just that I could walk through walls or I could do things that I didn't know how to do before. And so John's getting across this concept as well. That we may not understand what we're going to be like yet, but what we can understand and what we're told is we will be like Jesus. We will be like Jesus who is without sin. We will be like Jesus who doesn't have the pain and suffering of this world. We will be like Jesus who lives in that purity and has given us that purity. And that's the last thing that says. It says we have this hope, this faith that purifies. And here's where the verse comes in. It says, and all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. It is making clear to us that we have this hope, this faith, which is a gift from God, and that is what purifies us. But i got to tell you, this is the place in the passage where we also kind of get hung up and messed up and twisted around the axle with different thought processes because it's really easy for us to read this verse and get it wrong. We read the verse and it says, And all who have this hope in him purify themselves. Pretty clear, isn't it, Pastor? It says I purify myself. Something I do. Something I can be a part of. That's what it looks like as we read that verse. If we read it from a certain perspective of English. And i got to tell you, just as you're beginning to seem like it's something you can do, you'll run into some person who is a preacher, or you'll see them on TV, or you watch them on the internet, or hear them on the radio, and they'll be happy to tell you that this is something that you can do. That you must lead the pure life, that you must do all the right things, that Jesus won't accept you unless you have done all the right things in your life. And it starts to, to, to seem like it's correct because you've got this verse that says, I must purify myself, and you start down this road, the next thing, what do you know? You know guilt. You know shame. You know those feelings of anxiety that you've done things that are wrong. And you know what? It's really easy to give those things out to other people. It's really easy to make people feel guilt and shame because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all know that those things happen in our lives. And we come back to a verse like this and we want to say, it says I'm supposed to do this. And we're just one week past Reformation. Just one week past that Sunday where we talked about the fact that we can't do it ourselves. We are one week past that, that verse where Luther explains to us that God has done it. By grace are you saved through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. It's all about what God's done for us, and yet how quickly we run back to a verse and we look at it and we say, purify themselves and feel like it's something we should do. Now, I want to give you some ammunition for those times when Satan comes up in your life and says to you, look, the verse says purify yourself. It says it. John said it. You should be doing it. And Satan will be quick to point those things out to you, my friends, because Satan sits on my doorstep and when I think I'm doing pretty well, says, aren't you supposed to? And God says, already done it for you. So here's the point. There are a couple of different ways that we can be very clear and understand what it is that John is saying. First of all, we contend, and the Bible tells us, that Scripture interprets Scripture. In other words, you can't have something in the Bible that says this and something else that says that and have there be a difference. Okay? God doesn't do that to us. He doesn't give us things that are in contradiction to one another. So when God says to us, through St. Paul, that 
By grace are you saved through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. When John earlier says to us, see what love the Father has given, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are, it doesn't change two verses later. It doesn't change two books later. In other words, whatever we're reading into the text that, at that moment, we better look back and see what the rest of the Bible is saying. And the whole rest of the New Testament is saying that Jesus came and died for us and for our sins so that we would have forgiveness and we would have salvation. So why would we then turn things around in one verse and say, we have to purify ourselves? That's not what the Bible does. But more than that, this is one of those places where it's kind of nice to get into the Greek and actually look at the verb and look at how it works and what the meaning is. And I'm going to tell you, first of all, that this is a word in the Greek that shows up only once in the Bible. So John uses a word that isn't used a whole bunch of other places in this form. It makes it a little bit tougher sometimes to know what he's getting at, okay? But what he seems to be getting at when you look at the tense and you look at the mood, which we don't have mood in English, so that's kind of a weird thing to start talking about anyway. When you talk about the tense, it is a present tense active, which means it's going on right now. But the other part is the mood, which says that it is something that is a fact. It is not something that you're hoping to do. It is not something you're going to do in the future. It's not something, it's something that's already done. And so once you catch that part, which is a nuance of a language we aren't speaking when we read it in English, then you understand that what John's saying is this has been done for you and continues to be done for you. You are purifying yourself because of the gift God has given you. We are made pure through the faith, through the hope that God gives us. So as we read this again, and all who have this hope, in other words, all who have followed Jesus, all who have come to faith, all who have received the gift that I just talked about in the verses before, are made pure themselves because of what God has done for them. Now, here's the cool part. The cool part is, if you have been made pure and you can go through your life saying, God has taken away my sins and made me pure, now you can try to live your life a different way than when you feel guilt and shame and anxiety. Because I don't know about you, but when I'm feeling guilt, when I'm feeling shame, when I'm feeling anxiety, I am not as nice a person as when I'm feeling like, woohoo, it's a good day, right? When I'm not feeling like people are upset with me, when I'm not feeling those concerns that I've hurt others, I'm a much happier person. And that's who God wants us to be. God wants us to be cheerful, happy people who are loving to others because of the love he has poured out into us. He wants us to be able to share with others that we are brothers and sisters with Jesus and not worried about condemnation, but thankful for the gift that God has given us. And that's why on All Saints Day, we can we can reflect, we can celebrate, rejoice, and we can remember. And we can do all of those things because of God who has loved us so much that he's made us and our loved ones children and brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we celebrate on All Saints Day, not only that those who have gone before us and are in the glories of heaven, but that God has prepared a place for us, and we will be there soon. In Jesus' name, amen.